Welcome to the official demo for how to create your multi-page digital layout using Adobe InDesign. So the example you see in front of you here may or may not resemble what your structure has chosen to give you for choices on this project, but it matters not because what I'm going to show you is how to do some very basic things in InDesign, basic things that you will need to do. So one of them is, for instance, getting in a picture, creating type within InDesign. And not just big type, little type too, with smaller pictures and smaller pictures that the type can run around. That's called a text wrap. We're going to talk about a master page and how you can do stuff on a master page and it will automatically apply to all of the pages in your document. So these images here, you'll see the front cover, um, the image you saw on page two, and now this image here. Uh, these represent the pictures that you are going to be taking yourself for this project. Um, you are going to need to place them into here, resize them, crop them. All this stuff will be discussed in this video. And uh, by the way, I I'm not going to go into great detail on many things in this video because there are already a ton of videos for InDesign. And so you can watch those videos and they will give you explicit detail on how to do all the little things you could possibly ever want to do for the class. Um, this is really just meant to show you the basic things you need to know to create this project. But if it's not giving you enough information, check out the other videos. Again, this may not be very similar to what you're doing, but the techniques used to create this are going to be very similar. So uh, let's get started. So here we are in InDesign. Uh, obviously nothing has been opened or created yet in terms of a new document, but that's what we're going to do right now. Set up your new document. So I am going to go to the button right here that says Create New. You can also find this under the File menu. And that will open up this nifty little window right here. And uh, as with Illustrator, um, this window has become more complicated over the last few versions, but we're going to keep it simple. We're not even going to pay attention to any of the stuff over here, or any of the presets. We're just going to punch in the numbers we need. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing is we want to make sure our units of measurement are inches, unless you are already versed in points and picas. Uh, which I doubt that you are, and you don't need to be. Uh, I'm going to set the width to 8 inches, and I'm going to set the height to 10 inches, and I'm going to make sure the orientation is vertical. Uh, next up is number of pages, and so this is going to be variable depending on your instructor and depending on kind of the rules you've been given for the project. But I think most of us are going to give you a three-page minimum, and so it needs to be at least three pages, and then it can be as many more pages as you want it to be. So my layout, the example I showed you at the beginning of this, is five pages. Now you may or may not know exactly how many pages it's going to end up being, but it doesn't matter because it's very easy to add and subtract pages from within InDesign. But I'm going to go ahead and just put in five pages. Uh, facing pages, you do not want that to be checked. Um, you only check that if you are creating what are called spreads, which are two side-by-side -side pages. So think of an open book or an open magazine. So we're just having single pages. Uh, the starting page number should be number one, and uh, then I'm just going to make sure the number of columns I have is one column, because that is what my design calls for. Um, we're not going to worry about margins or bleed and slug. Finally, I will click Create, and that will open up my new document in InDesign. And so before we can get working, we need to talk about the basic interface here the workspace that you are going to be using. Uh, so first thing I want to do is uh, pull your attention to the upper right corner where mine currently says Essentials. Now this is a drop down menu and these are different workspaces that you can choose to work in. So I'm going to demonstrate using the Essentials workspace. I think it's a very basic kind of all-purpose workspace, and so it'll serve you well for this class, but just know that you can make other choices and customize this however you want. Um, so if you've already got Essentials selected and your screen looks like mine, you're probably fine, but if you want to be sure, click Reset Essentials, and that will give you this. 
Now, the interface um, has become simpler with InDesign, I'm happy to say, because of the inclusion of this properties window, which is very similar to the properties window that you used in Illustrator. So how nice is that? Very. Um, your tools are over here to the left. I always like to switch to the two column view. It's easier for me to tell you where to find the tools. And then over here in the properties window and the pages window, um, that's the only ones we're really going to be working with today. Uh, but properties is great. And again, like Illustrator, it's contextual. So depending on what tool you have selected, what is selected within your artboard, then um, it will determine what is showing up here in the properties window. Now there still are lots of windows that you can open and add uh, to this working space, but um, I would just not worry about that until there's something that you need that isn't in the properties window, and this is where you're going to come to grab it. So let me go back to the pages window here, and you'll see there are the five pages we created. Now if you wanted to get rid of a page, you can click on the page you want to get rid of, and down at the bottom of this panel, there is a trash can. You can click on that, and immediately the page is gone. But suppose you discover, oh, I actually need more pages. Well, right next to the trash can is this little icon with a plus sign, and you can click on that to add pages into your document. So as you can see, how accurate you were in terms of the number of pages you created and when you set up the document, uh, it doesn't really matter very much. Now you'll notice on these pages um, that they have a letter A at the top of them. This means that a master page has been applied to them. So what does this mean exactly? I don't want to know. It means that anything you put on the master page will automatically show up on all the pages where that master has been applied. And so InDesign automatically applies it to all five pages, so anything I go and put on this master page will instantly show up on those five pages. So that's really, that's really a good thing because if you have, say, common elements or you have a, a page number that you want to be in a certain location on every page, do it on the master page and, uh, and then you're, uh, you're cooking with gas, my friend. Before we get into working on that master page, however, let me show you how to navigate around. Um, there's different ways to do this. Um, there's even a little space down here in the bottom where you can type in a page number or do a drop-down menu to go to a page. Um, I never use that. Um, you can open up the pages window and just double click on a page and it will automatically go to it. Um, you can't really tell because the pages all look the same at this point. Um, you can very simply just scroll up and down like this, and all the pages are just stacked one on top of the other. Uh, so if I have a really big document, I tend to use the pages window. If I just have a few pages, I tend just to scroll, but that obviously is up to you. Um, also added to the properties window now is this little area called page, which is pretty nice. And here I can just choose the drop down menu and choose a page from there. So at this point, I'm going to choose the A master. And so I am now in the master page. How can I tell that? Well, it says so right here under the page drop down menu. Also says it at the bottom left of your uh, document window. Uh, so again, this is where I can put elements that will soon apply to every single page in my document. So there's a couple of things I want to do. I would like to create margins, because I didn't spend the time to do those when I set up the file. Uh, so that is not a big deal to do. You'll notice that I can set margins right here in the properties window. That's very nice. Um, if you have columns, however, you can also go up here to the layout uh, menu and pull down to margins and columns. And that will allow you to set up your margins as well as change your number of columns. And then if you have uh, multiple columns, you need to specify the gutter. The gutter is the space in between the columns. Since I have this window open, I'm going to go ahead and set my margins here. And uh, they're going to be pretty simple. My top margin is going to be 1 inch. My bottom margin is going to be 0.85 inches. And then my left and my right margins are both going to be 1.1. Now, if you notice that when you change one number, it changes all four, well, that means that this link symbol has been selected. And that's what that's meant to do, where if you link it together, 
change one, they all change. Um, you usually don't want that to be the case with margins, so that's why mine is unchecked. Uh, I'm going to keep my number of columns at one and just click OK. And there we go. So I know those margins have now been established on each of the pages. But I actually want to uh, put a graphic element on this page too. You may not remember from the example I showed you, but at the top of that was a black bar at the top of every single page. So why should I have to make that for each page? Why can't I just make it once and make it be a master element? Well, I can, so there. So I'm going to get my rectangle tool, which is the sixth one down. So I'm going to draw a box across the top of my page, and you'll notice it just kind of snaps into position. That's nice, and I'm not going to be too worried about the exact size, because I can go right here to the Properties window, and I can see the X and the Y are set to zero. That's good. It means it's snapped to the upper left corner. And I can see the width is 8 inches, perfect, because that's how wide the page is. But the height I would like to change. So I'm going to change the height of that to a 0.375, which is 3 eighths of an inch. Boom, fixed. And then obviously it's invisible right now. There's nothing inside of it. So to change that, I'm going to click on the little fill box right here. And I'm going to select black. And uh, then that is done. That's really all I want to do on the master page for now. So I'm going to go back here to this little page drop down menu and I'm going to specify that I want to go to page one. And there it is on page one. If I scroll down, you will see that it is on all of five, the five pages. So that's good. So if there's more things that are in common on each page in yours, definitely put it in your A master page. Now. I am not going to need this on my cover because my cover is what's called a full bleed. The cover is taking the full size of the page. And so you'll notice that when I come to my master element, I can't click on it. I can't grab this thing. Well, that's because master elements are locked and supposedly you need to go back to the master page to remove it. But I only want to remove it from this one page. So can you do that? Yep. And by holding the command or control key and the shift key both, that allows you to click and mark a master element. In other words, unlock it. Now all I have to do is hit the delete key. And you may be panicking at this point, but then you are not a professional as I am. And uh, because I know that that is still going to be on all the other pages. It deleted it only from that first page. So that's what comes of keeping your cool. Let that be a lesson to you. Okay, next up, we are going to start getting some pictures and type in here. Okay, so something very important has not occurred yet, and that is that I have not saved my file. So if uh, the computer gods are against me today, then they will crash my computer and everything I've done so far is lost. So um, let's not go there, shall we? And so I'm going to go to File, Save, or Command, or Control, S. And uh, I am just going to navigate to my desktop, where I already have a folder for this project, where I already have all my pictures and copy that I'm going to insert. And so I'm just going to put my file right in there. And now I just got to make sure I regularly save. Um, I will not belabor the saving point anymore. I know your teachers have already beat you over the head with that, but uh, save, 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 save. All right, so next up, I want to get a couple of images in here. Now, before I bring in the first image, there's something you need to understand about InDesign. Uh, everything must be in a box. Now, I've, I've dealt with this in uh, other videos, so I'm not going to say much more than that here. But just remember, every picture, every piece of text must be in a box, and it actually is a separate box element. And so when we place your picture, not only is it going to bring in the picture, but it's going to put a box around it as well, which is a good thing, and you'll see why in a minute. So to get an image into the page, I'm going to reduce my page a little bit. I'm just going to go Command or Control minus. And then I'm going to go to the File menu and pull down to Place. And then inside my Imports folder here 
is my cover image. So open that. And this will give me what's called a loaded icon. So in other words, when I click, it will release the image, and it gives me this little preview of what that image is. So I'm just going to click, and I know already that my image is a little bit bigger than the page. So this gray line you see right here, uh, that is the edge of the page. Anything outside of that gray line will not show up. So I, with my black arrow tool, can just click and hold and drag this and move it around. So nothing too surprising there, um, same as an illustrator. But something that may be a little surprising is if you try to grab one of the handles and you know you're even smart and uh, hold down the shift key and you may think that when you drag that you are resizing the picture but on the contrary you are not. You have just cropped the picture. And so that's because all you've dragged is the box around the picture, not the picture itself. So I'm going to undo that, Command or Control Z. And uh, now I need to do one of two things. I can either get the free transform tool, which is this guy right here underneath the rectangle tool. And then if I click and drag, and again I will hold the shift key, then I am resizing the picture. Okay. So this allows me to uh, reduce or enlarge the picture and its box at the same time. That's pretty nice. Now another way you can do this, and I just mentioned this in case you prefer keystrokes, is I can keep my black arrow tool selected, and then I can hold the command or control key along with the shift key, and that will do exactly the same thing. But if you are learning, I would just use the free transform tool for now. When you're ready to switch to keystrokes, you will do so. So at this point, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to end up cropping this, but I do want this whole thing to be about this size, and that's about the right position. And so at this point, I do want to crop it. So I'm going to grab a handle, and I'm not holding any keys at all. And you'll notice that it snaps right to the page outline. And uh, there we are. So very nice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this. Now you'll notice that you've got those purple-pink lines happen in there. Very pretty colors, but you don't always want to see them. So let me tell you a cool trick. If you, and you cannot do this when you have the type tool selected for obvious reasons, but if you just hit the W key, that will toggle you into preview mode. And so that gets rid of all the guides, just shows you the page and what's inside of the page. Uh, so I do that all the time. So I'm going to hit the W key again, and my guides return. So I will do that a lot because I really like seeing how my layout looks without those lines, because obviously they aren't going to be there in the final PDF. So that is how you get a picture in. Let's go ahead and get another one in while it's fresh in our noggins. And so I'm going to scroll down to page two, and then same thing. I'm going to go to place. Uh, this time I'm going to put in the 1865 to 1963 image and released it. So obviously this is a lot bigger than I'm going to need it. And it also needs to be cropped, so I'm going to crop it first. So I'm just going to grab the handles, and I don't want to see any of that background that is currently in there. So I'm just going to crop till I don't see any background. And you can see initially at first it's a real pain that um, you have this extra box around your images. But it's actually quite convenient to be able to crop a picture that easily. Now that I've got my box and my picture um, in relationship to each other, now I can get the free transform tool, hold the shift key, and I can resize this bad boy to whatever size I want it to be. So I'll probably need to adjust this, but that's about the size and position it's going to end up going into. So placing images is really quite easy, very similar to Illustrator. It's just that you've got that extra box to deal with. Okay, next up, let's get some type in here, shall we? Okay, so I want to create some type here in InDesign. Um, I'll show you after this how to import text, um, specifically your Word document. But what if you just want to create type within here? So for instance, the head and the subhead on the first page. 
out. What I need to do, predictably enough, is get the type tool. And uh, I'm just going to draw a box inside of here. And not going to worry too much about the size it is now. Um, you'll see it's given me a cursor that's over here to the top left of that box. So why did I draw a box? Well, duh, you got to have a box around everything. And so I'm going to go ahead and type in my headline, which is very simply, I have a dream in all caps. And there is a line break in there. And I am not typing ghost letters. It is just black on black. So I can just go ahead and drag over the type. And then I can come over here to the fill box. And I can say, please make that white, um, which is paper color. So paper color just means the color of the paper is showing through. Uh, OK, there we go. Now that is not the typeface I want, nor is it the size or anything else. So I'm going to mark that again. And that brings up the character window over here in the properties window. And so here are the specs I want. Um, we're not going to play around. I know exactly what I want it to be. And so I would like it to be uh, Babis Noya. I have no idea if I'm saying that correctly. Um, Noya, I'm pretty sure is right. Babis, I'm not sure. Is it Bebas, Bebas? Who knows? Babis is good enough for me. So there, I've chosen it and uh, it has changed. Now that is still much too small. Uh, I want to make it 32 points big, and I would like to change the line spacing, more correctly known as letting, and that should be 30 points, and you'll see that makes it closer together. Now the one thing I'm not getting is that I want my type to be centered within the page. So I could do this. I could take my type box and kind of drag it over and hope the smart guides help me get it centered or, you know, pull in guidelines. But isn't that all a big pain in the butt? Yeah. I would much rather do this. I'm going to make the box the same size as my margins, and I know my margins are centered within the page. And then I can just change the alignment down here in the properties window to centered, and boom, my type is now centered in the page. I would like the baseline of the I have a line of type to be sitting on that top margin line. So that will relate it to the content that comes inside. And now at this point, I can kind of decide, do I like the way the picture looks with my type? Well, I do basically, but it's not perfect. And so here's another neat thing you can do with having these, you know, box around the picture is if I go inside, you'll notice you'll get that gray circle inside. And then if I click on that gray circle, it will mark the picture, but not the box. And so now if I click and drag, I can move the picture without moving the box and just change the relationships a little bit. So I think that's more about where I want that to be. Let me do a preview here. Oh yeah, absolute genius. A work of art if ever I saw one. So bring my guides back and then I'm ready to get in my next block of type. Now, uh, I'm not going to make you watch me while I type all this. Um, through the magic of editing, this will magically appear now. And voila, my layout she be done. We're good to go and ready to move on to uh, getting our body copy in. What's nice is that you get your body copy in the same way you get your pictures in you are going to be placing your text. And instead of placing a Photoshop document, as we did here already, we're going to place a Word document. Uh, the margins we put in are going to help us control our type, and we're going to be able to flow this from page to page quite easily. So uh, anyway, let's get to it. I'm going to go to the File menu again, pull down to Place. And this time, I just navigate right to the uh, document, the Word document and click open. So here is my loaded icon again. Uh, this time you'll notice that it looks like type. And if you look really, really, really closely, it actually is the real type, which I always enjoy that. I click and look at that. It conforms right to the page. Now it is going over the top of the picture, but don't worry about that. We'll fix that in a little bit but it conforms right to those margins. Now if I scroll down, does it continue? 
No, it does not. It just fills in and makes a box the same size um, as those uh, margins. You will notice, however, that at the bottom right of this box is a little square with a plus sign in it. And what that's going to allow me to do is to continue to flow my copy into the other pages. So I'm going to click on that, and son of a gun, it reloads my icon. I'm going to pull down to page 3 now and do the same thing. Just click in the upper left corner, and there we go, another page of text, and we still have more to come. So I'm going to click on the red plus sign again, scroll down one more time, and let's see if this will finish it off, and it does. Now there is another page left here, but I know from having done this already that that will end up being needed, but for right now it's only flowing into three pages. Uh, so pretty great. Now what's nice is that this type really is connected. So for instance, if I click on this piece of type on page two and I change the size of the box, um, watch the type underneath it on page three. Like, oh my god. See that? So it's disappearing from page two and flowing down into page three. It's really good at handling large amounts of text. And you can imagine if you were doing a newspaper or a magazine or something like that, and you started a story on page one and it continued on page 12, well, all you would need to do is click that little plus sign on page one, move over to page 12, and continue the article right there and those two parts of the article would be dynamically linked and that is the case with here so as we make changes into this type our copy will continue to adjust and reflow a really neat thing so don't do it any other way if you think you just want to place your copy four times and adjust the box into what's showing trust me you will go insane um, do not go there uh, so next thing I want to do is just get my copy styled the way I want it. Uh, so in, as opposed to dragging through three whole pages, um, this is what I recommend you do. Get your type tool, click inside one of the boxes, and then do a select all. And that's command or control A. It's also available under the edit menu and now every single bit of type is showing. Even if you have type that hasn't been released yet, it would still be marked. And so now I can go ahead and change this to Cambria, which is the typeface I'm using. So I'm gonna just search for it, there it is. And then the size I want this to be is 11.5. Yes, you can split points. And by the way, this is a pretty good size for this type of a document. Uh, this is digital, so the rules are a little bit different than print. Um, you could go a little bit bigger than this, and when I say a little, I mean 12 point, maybe 13, depending on the typeface. And you could go a little bit smaller than this, say down to 10 points, uh, 9 or 10 points perhaps. Um, but that's going to be the range you're in, so don't push it. Um, also, keep in mind that uh, InDesign will automatically give you a certain amount of letting or line spacing, and uh, you want to make sure that's going to work. Um, for instance, I know what, what InDesign gives me, I don't think is enough for this type of reading, so I'm going to increase my letting to be 16 points. And that will open it up, and that will make it much more readable. Okay, so that's good. All of our type has now been styled. Um, there are other things you can do. We could go in and adjust our tabs. I'm not going to do that here because um, there is a video on doing that. Obviously, if you didn't want to have indents, if you wanted to have space between your paragraphs, well, you could certainly do that by adding a line in between and then changing the amount of line space on that to make it smaller or bigger or whatever you want it to be. So all of that is possible, but I'm not going to cover all of that in this particular video. Next up, let's create a text wrap. So creating a text wrap just means that you are asking the type to go around the picture. So as you can probably see here, uh, the black type is going on top of the image which obviously uh, makes it hard to see the picture and impossible to read the type in that area. 
So we want to tell InDesign to wrap around the picture. And so to do this is very simple. All I need to do is get the text wrap window open. And so if I click on the picture with my black arrow, um, I can actually access text wrap in here. And so you'll see here are my different choices. Uh, no text wrap, which is what's currently set. I can wrap around the bounding box or I can wrap around an object or shape. And so say you have a picture where you have the background removed and the background is either transparent or uh, white. You can go in and you can wrap around the shape. And again, there's a videotape on this, so watch that if you want to know how to do that specifically. But for right now, we're just going to wrap around the bounding box, meaning the same box that is around the picture. So I'm going to choose that, and you'll notice it immediately works. Now, the problem is, is that this type is going right to the edge of the picture, and you never, ever, ever want to do that. It makes it really hard to read, and it's visually very uncomfortable. And so uh, to fix that, all you need to do is come down to these controls below these little icons. Now you'll notice there is that chain link symbol right here. And since I don't want to uh, do a text wrap on all four sides, I'm going to unclick that. And really the only place I need to wrap the text or change the space with the text wrap is on the right side, which is right here. And so if I just click the up arrow, I can also type in a number if I want. And I'm just going to give it a little breathing room. Very nice. And that is all there is to it. Now, what's really neat, though, is what if I decide, you know, that picture is bigger than I want it to be. So I'm going to resize it. Let me get my free transform. And look at that. Everything just continues to re-rag. The type continues to reflow. Um, and I know ultimately this is going to end up being a little lower in the page. So let me pull it down a bit. And just like that, everything adjusts because of the way a text wrap works and because of the way the type is all connected to itself. It's one continuous block, even though it's in four separate pieces. Now, I've noticed that at the bottom here, I see this little red circle, which is off-putting, and it says error. And I know what that error is, so let's go down and fix that. Basically, because we put that picture in there and, and did the wrap around it, we have filled up this box, this type box here, and there's more text that isn't showing. That's called overset. And so if I get my black arrow again, click on that little plus sign. And let me try that again. There we go. Load the icon and then click and that will release the remainder of the text. And that creates the fourth text box, and that's all we're, we're going to need to finish this up. So that's how text wraps work. Very easy. If you need more info, check out the video on text wraps, and it will give you all this and, and much more. The next thing I want to do is uh, show you how to add a new color swatch. So when we went into the fill box earlier to change the uh, color of the box on the master page, you may have noticed when I clicked on this fill box, there weren't many choices in here. And uh, quite honestly, the choices they do have are rather garish. Ew. So you're not going to probably want to use these colors in your layout. So what are you going to do if you want to use different colors? So my example, for instance, had kind of a deep warm brown in it and that's the color I want because it really ties into all of my images. So what's up? How do I do that? Well it's actually fairly easy to add swatches. You can open up the swatches window under the window menu but you can also do it here just in the fill box. Up in the upper right of pretty much every window that you open are always going to be these three lines and this is true in Illustrator and Photoshop too. Um, that will open up a menu that is related to this window. And you'll notice at the very top, it says New Color Swatch. So I'm going to do that. Now, this will open up this window. And if you're conversant with creating color using RGB or with CMYK, and you'd rather do those, that's absolutely fine. Um, however, most of you are not. Uh, so here is an, is an ink system that you can use that gives you a choice of tons of different colors. 
And so I'm going to drop this color mode menu right here. And about three quarters of the way down is a choice called Pantone Plus Solid. So Pantone is an ink system that's for printing. I'm going to select that. And you will see this will open up just tons and tons and tons of colors in this menu. And so if you if you have a color in mind, you will find it in here. Actually, I do have a color in mind, and it is PMS 1545. So I can just search for that, and it will go right to it. So you can see it's kind of a dark, warm uh, brown. That's good. And then all I have to do is if I want to do multiple colors, I just click Add. If I only want this one color, I can just click OK and it adds that right there to my swatches. So if you th think you might want access to a bunch of different colors, you can go in and add as many colors to this swatch uh, window as you want beforehand, and then kind of decide later. But I just knew specifically I wanted that color. So that's added, and now I can start using that and applying it to my type. The type I want to do next is my emphasis type, and uh, let's go. So you probably remember from my example at the beginning that I had, in addition to my pictures, had lots of type that is larger. Um, you could consider these pull quotes, but technically that's not what they are. It really is in position within the text, and you just read it along as you're reading through the text. So I call it emphasis type. And so it's meant to stand out to give you a secondary reading so that if you're just kind of skimming through this, as people do with editorial design, then if they do nothing more than look at the pictures and read the bold type, they're getting the gist or the important points of what this copy is about. So I actually had two levels of emphasis. I had the big black text and then I had the smaller brown text. And the smaller brown text were kind of subpoints to the primary black text. This is an interesting approach. Um, don't feel like you need to do this, but sometimes bringing in pull quotes or, or excerpts or just large type to focus the reader on that message is something that can be very powerful. So anyway, to do this, I actually have three different sizes of type here in two different fonts. So how am I going to go about doing that? Well, in my original design, I went in and I created character styles and paragraph styles. And what that means is you define the style once, and then you can apply it all over the place as many times as you want. It saves a lot of time. It just takes a little bit of knowledge and know-how and time up front. But once you've done it, it saves you a ton of time, and then it allows you to easily make changes down the road. Um, if you think you want to do that for this project, then check out the videos on character and paragraph styles and image styles, too. Uh, but for here, I'm just going to show you how to change the typefaces because you're beginning, and uh, this is probably a good starting point for you. So uh, let's get back into InDesign, and we'll go ahead and do this. Okay, so the first bit of type that I would like to emphasize is this first sentence here in the second paragraph. Five score years ago, a great American, etc. And so I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to get rid of that indent at the front because I don't need it to be indented because it will be obvious it's a new thought. And I also don't want this line that comes after it, this momentous decree, I want that to be underneath it so that you can see it really is meant to be a standalone statement and it will still continue through just fine. So now I can mark just that sentence and then obviously it's as simple as changing the typefaces. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be the Babis again. And uh, we're going to make that 18 points with 22 points of letting. And there we go. So you can see that started to go right into the picture, which I don't want it to do, but not a problem. I can mark the picture, and I can just slowly move it down. Uh, right about there is good. Yeah, just till it kind of feels balanced and there's a nice amount of white space around it. So that's cool. The uh, secondary comment I did was this right here, where I've actually lost the indent on this already. 
but 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. So um, the use of the term Negro obviously dates this to the early 60s, um, but still, it's a very powerful, powerful statement. Um, now it's been over 150 years. And so uh, let's go ahead and change that as well. And that is going to be 13 points with 16 points of letting. And uh, the same as the body copy. And I also want this to be that dark brown color. So I'm going to go to the fill area. And there is that Pantone color that I added earlier. And just like that, I have applied it. And so you can see that's all, that's all there is to it. It's really quite simple. Um, if I want to go in and add a little bit of space to add more room between things, then I certainly have that ability. Um, I do want to um, maybe make a little bit more space there. So I'm going to mark that line and just increase the letting a couple, three points, just to make there be a little more space. That also lines the top of the type up with the top of the image, which I think is very nice. Um, if you decided that you would like to have a little extra space before you get to that, then you can certainly do that as well, um, just by adding a line and then making the amount of space between the lines be whatever you want. And in editorial design, these little touches uh, end up making a really big difference. And so uh, your goal on this should be to get your layout, your basic layout done first, work through the whole thing, and then just keep going back through it, uh, refining, 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 until you run out of time. Then you turn it in. Um, but the more you refine and the more attention you pay to the little details, uh, the better off you're going to be with this project and the better the communication you will be creating. Okay, one last little bonus thing I thought I would do on this video too is let's go ahead and get the type into the black bars at the top of the pages. And uh, obviously to do that, we're going to need to go back to the master page. So here we are on the master page. And uh, the type we want to put up into that top black box is exactly the same as the type that is on the front cover. And so I am going to just draw a box and uh, just make it this size for now. And then I'm going to type in, I have a dream. And then I've already copied the subhead from the cover, so I'm going to paste that in here. Now you can't see it because it's white, so I'm going to do a select all and uh, change the fill to be black for all of the text. Uh, now the type was stacked kind of weird on the front page, and so I am going to just hit some returns and bring that all up. Now it's not all going to fit here, and obviously one of the fonts um, is incorrect, and which leads me to another rather groovy trick. So you've probably played with the eyedropper tool, probably most likely in Photoshop with color sampling, but you can do it here in InDesign and Illustrator too. If I just drag over that type, here's the eyedropper tool right here. And I can just click on this text that I want to match, and it will automatically change the text I marked into the correct size and style. Groovy, eh? Um, so now obviously this is a little bit too big, um, so I need to go in and do some adjusting. So I'm going to make my box be the whole width of the page, but basically I want it to fit in between the two margins here. So I need to change my alignment to centered, and uh, then I'm going to go in here and select my type. And I am going to, yep, Baby Snoya, that's perfect. I don't want it to be 15 point, actually. I want it to be 12 point. And the letting really doesn't matter because there's only one line, but I'm going to make it be 15. And then uh, you'll see it's still a little bit short um, from the margins. And that's because I haven't added any extra space in yet, which I want to do here. Uh, so when you add overall letter spacing, that's called tracking. And so this little VA here, that's representing tracking. And if I drop this menu, you'll see that there are negative numbers and positive numbers. If I choose a negative number, it makes the spacing tighter. And if I choose a positive number, it makes the spacing more open. So 
25 is a little too much, so I'm just going to go ahead and change that to 20. And that fits just about right. Now the other thing I need to do is I need to make this not be black anymore. Um, it's going to need to be white so that you can read it on the uh, black bar up there. So I'm going to mark this, change the color back to white, get my arrow tool, and then I can just drag this right up here and arrange it until it is right where I want it to be. Looks pretty good to me. Let's preview it. Sweet. Now, you may say, but Ron, that's all running together. Well, yes, it is. Let's fix that, shall we? Okay. So I'm going to mark I have a dream, and I'm going to change the color of that to be brown, but that brown is too dark, so I'm going to make this be a 65% tint of that color. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the March on Washington. And I'm going to get my eyedropper tool again. Boom. And then it loads my eyedropper tool. So now I can just drag over this very last block, Lincoln Memorial, and it will change that one too. So uh, that's pretty unique to InDesign. I've never seen that in another program, and I really love that feature. So let's save this, and let's go back and check out page two. And there it is. And so now that is appearing on all the different pages. Um, I also, in my original design, oops, we'll have to figure out what happened there. Um, in my original design, I put my page numbers on the master page too. Uh, looks like I accidentally filled the containing box um, with brown. So I can easily go into the fill box and just say, nope, don't want that, and change it back to none. So. Uh, that's pretty much it in terms of what I want to show you for how to do stuff for this project in InDesign. Uh, we pretty much completed this page. Um, and pretty much what we learned doing the first page and the second page is what you're going to need to know to uh, create your layout. Uh, the last thing you need to do, obviously, is to create your PDF file. And so I'll show you how to do that next. All right, so when you are done, then this is the last step that you need to do, and that is to save this as a PDF file. Uh, so I'm going to go to the File menu, and unlike in Illustrator and Photoshop, this is not a Save As. This is an Export, and so that's a little more than halfway down the File menu. So I'm going to choose that. And then here is this simple page. I'm just going to put it in the same folder. I'm actually going to let it have the same name. Well, now let's be practical. I'm going to put my name on this so that it is um, identifiable. And uh, then the format. Down here, uh, you should use Adobe PDF Print. Now, we're going to use Adobe PDF Interactive for the final project, but we don't have interactive features in this PDF. Um, by doing it as a PDF print, this allows us to let the file be printed if anybody wants to print it, but it will still view on screen very well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and click Save. And then when you get the second window, here's the preset you need to use. You want to use High Quality Print Preset. Uh, down here under Pages, definitely make sure All is marked. And you want to make sure that Pages is marked, not Spreads. Spreads, again, are uh, facing pages, side-by-side -side pages. So if you're doing single pages, then you want to make sure Pages is checked. Uh, the defaults for everything else um, are just fine. And uh, just click Export, and you'll end up with a good-looking file that doesn't take very much memory. So here is the PDF, which uh, we just exported. Uh, and if I change the page, you'll see there's everything we did. So uh, obviously, I uh, exported prematurely. Uh, but you can see that it worked out just fine. And so I would need to finish this up, export another PDF, and all will be right with the world. So uh, anyway, I have a dream, too that you guys will do really well on this project, jump in, have a good time, and do some beautiful layouts.